Welcome to Around the Empire, the show that takes you around the U.S. Empire. I'm your host, Dan Wright. I'm your co-host, Joanne Leo. On today's episode, January 18th, 2017, we speak with former CIA officer John Kiriakou. But before we do that, here is Around the Empire. We begin with United States Africa Command, expanding U.S. interests in Africa. Carlisle Group will control South Africa's largest credit agency, the Carlisle Group, with $169 billion in assets as a U.S. buyout fund and will become the largest shareholder for Global Credit Ratings, South Africa's largest pan-African ratings agency. Carlisle Group is one of the largest private equity funds associated with the Bush family, as well as the Bin Laden family and others. The U.S. has an increasing role throughout the continent and is now in over 20 countries with special forces operations. On to United States European Command. Ukraine officials are, quote, scrambling to make amends with the president-elect after quietly working to boost Clinton. Kenneth Vogel and David Stern of Political Europe say that Ukrainian efforts to sabotage Trump have backfired. Alexander Trilupa, a Ukrainian-American former Clinton administration employee, and former DNC staffer worked on opposition research against Trump and coordinated with the Ukrainian embassy. The DNC told Politico that she did it all on her own and not at their direction. <laughs> if you believe that one. A European ex-leader sent a letter to warn Trump against restoring relations with and lifting sanctions on Russia. They tried to convince Trump that somehow a deal with Putin will not bring peace. On the contrary, it makes war more likely. Not exactly a logical argument. Now on to the United States Pacific Command. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal, President-elect Donald Trump, or now president, said that everything is open to negotiation with U.S. policy on China, including the One China policy on Taiwan. China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi told Hong Kong media that, quote, the One China principle is the cornerstone of the healthy development of Sino-U.S. relations, and we do not want any interference or destruction of this political foundation. Trump mocked the fact that the U.S. sold $2 billion in arms to Taiwan, but can't accept a congratulatory phone call from the head of state. The statement on Taiwan issued by the Chinese Foreign Minister Liu Kang left no room for doubt. Quote, the one China principle is non-negotiable. On to the United States Southern Command. In Cuba, a flurry of small deals put in place before Trump takes office. Cuba and foreign partners began drilling for oil in the Gulf of Mexico. And there are concerns that the U.S. would not be able to participate in oil spill responses because of remaining sanctions. A, quote, oil spill pact was signed by the Obama administration and the Cuban government to prepare joint disaster plans, test them, and train personnel, among other measures. This is one of the flurry of small deals in recent weeks being put in place before the Trump administration takes control, since Trump has threatened to scrap a still fragile detente between the two countries unless Cuba makes further political and economic concessions. Moving on to United States Central Command. In Iraq, the army is advancing rapidly in Mosul. The Iraqi army is advancing and is now within, quote, striking distance of Saddam Hussein's presidential palace in Mosul. This is the first time in nearly two and a half years that the government forces have seen the site. Kevin Barron of Defense One recalls many conversations with troops and officers at a U.S. military base without a name in Erbil. They helped formulate and, and want to continue the Obama doctrine in which the U.S. and coalition forces fight ISIS by, with, and through local forces, and at a patient pace. Barron noted that the covert base at Kurdistan International Airport is growing into a permanent base. Quote, it seems the U.S. military is in Iraq to stay. Unquote. Oh, and so they are. Temporary quarters are being replaced with permanent buildings to accommodate, quote, American forces, including special operators, CIA agents, and private military contractors. In Afghanistan, more Marines deployed to Helmand. 300 Marines from Camp Lejeune will deploy to Helmand province in Afghanistan to advise and assist the Afghan forces struggling against the Taliban, which controls 85% of the province now. A year ago, it was controlled only 20%. Helmand is the province where most of the poppies for heroin are grown. Marines left this province in Afghanistan as part of the President Obama's promised 2014 withdrawal. Some of the 300 Marines have been deployed here before. And some will stay at Camp Leatherneck, which was turned over to the Afghan forces in 2014. And finally, to the United States Northern Command, the home front, the latest dirty dossier stunned by the media and U.S. intelligence on Trump. State Department veteran Peter Van Buren, who was retaliated against for writing a book criticizing reconstruction projects in Iraq, notes that the latest stunt against President Trump by the U.S. intelligence community leaders has, quote, collapsed like a paper bag in the rain. 
A senior intelligence official told NBC that the salacious opposition research addendum to the dossier used in the alleged Russian hack briefing last week was not given to Trump, nor was it included in an oral briefing. So there's some dispute about that. Numerous U.S. media outlets, CNN and others, such as the New York Times, claimed that the chief of Americans' intelligence agencies last week presented both President Obama and President Trump, then President-elect Trump, with a summary of unsubstantiated reports that Russia had collected compromising and salacious personal information about Mr. Trump. Trump reacted by blaming the intelligence agencies for leaking the f- fake news, quote-unquote, addendum to the classified dossier, and by saying on Twitter, quote, are we living in Nazi Germany? The Kremlin spokesman denied the claim that Russia didn't have the material and called the story a fake information, a fabrication. This is Pulp Fiction. The name of the former British spy who prepared the dirty dossier, Christopher David Steele, formerly of MI6, was revealed, but he was given time to flee his home and go into hiding before the revelation, according to the Telegraph, British news media. Steele is the co-founder of Orbis Business Intelligence Limited, and was hired by a firm in Washington, first by Trump's Republican enemies, and then by Democrats backing Hillary Clinton, who, quote, shopped it to the media. Steele spent months shopping his flawed intelligence dossier to U.S. media, but now that his identity has been revealed and the U.S. media wants to talk to him, he refuses to comment. (laughs) Surprise, surprise. Things are stirred up all over in Britain as well. British intelligence are helping Steele hide Nigel Farage one-time UKIP leader of the United Kingdom Independence Party says they shouldn't help him. And the BBC security correspondent Frank Gardnier claims the dodgy dossier wasn't so dodgy when it was written and didn't have the bad spelling and, quote, ludicrous scenarios suggesting that it was the Yanks that rewrote it, unquote. According to the account of the BBC reporting from a commenter, British media headlines refer to the whole affair as the dirty dossier. The Telegraph reports that Whitehall and Downing Street were aware of the dossier. The Russian embassy in London tweeted that Christopher Steele still works for MI6. Just days ago, Russia claimed they knew of an impending official anti-Russia witch hunt involving the British Special Services. Hmm. MI6 chiefs are distancing themselves from Christopher Steele, the Sun tabloid reported, according to anonymous sources. One senior intelligence source called him an idiot. (laughs) Early on, The Guardian reported that well-known Uber hawk Senator John McCain passed documents to the FBI director. McCain said he was informed about the existence of the documents separate and by an intermediary from a Western allied state. I wonder who that could be. Dispatched on emissary missions overseas, McCain wants a special select Senate committee to be formed to investigate Trump and his elections connections to the Kremlin. If he can't get his way, then he says he will use the Armed Services Committee. He chairs and other committees will investigate, too. Director of National Intelligence James Clapper issued a public statement reporting that he had called Trump and denounced the media leaks as, quote, extremely corrosive and damaging to our national security. He said he believed that the intelligence community had not leaked the material to the media and that Congress had these materials before the intelligence community. The CIA's mouthpiece at The Washington Post, David Ignatius, published an op-ed on January 12th where he alleged that about intercepts between Lieutenant General, now National Security Advisor Mike Flynn, and the Russian ambassador. In an update, Ignatius says the Trump campaign told him that Flynn offered condolences for the killing of the Russian ambassador in Turkey and for the shootdown of a Russian plane carrying a choir. Ignatius did appearances on PBS News Hour with the same messaging and on NBC, during which an audio glitch caused him to repeat the word Russia, Russia, Russia over again <laughs> into his feed. So did someone at the CIA leak to Ignatius? Who is leaking these dossiers and floating them around? In other words, what on earth is going on at the CIA? Well, famous whistleblower John Kiriakou tells us next. was around the empire. Today on the show is former CIA officer John Kiriakou, who has a recent article in Reader Supporter News titled, I have come to the conclusion the country does not need a CIA. John's going to talk with us today about the article and his thoughts on the CIA. How are you going, John? Hey, doing well, thanks. How are you? Great. 
So I wanted to just lead off with this paragraph in the article that struck me. Quote, we can certainly have a discussion about whether or not the country even needs a CIA. I have come to the conclusion that it does not. The excellent civil servants in the State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research can do the analysis. The Pentagon's Defense Human Services can recruit and run human sources around the world. A myriad of DOD and other civilian offices and bureaus can do the science and technology development. And I couldn't help but think when I read that of the the book I read that I highly recommend everybody called Legacy of Ashes. Oh, yes. Which is which is actually a quote from President Eisenhower, who I guess at the end of his presidency figured out that he, the Dulles brothers had kind of been running him around and said that he was leaving to his, well, we now know John Kennedy, uh, a legacy of ashes. So can you talk about just that, I just from that basic, like, do we need a CIA? And what, if these other services can be performed by other agencies, as you noted, should we just end it? I think we should just end it. Uh, I'm certainly not the first person to say this. Uh, President Eisenhower said it. President Kennedy said it. Just said it just two weeks before he was assassinated. Um, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the late senator from the state of New York, wrote a book about it in 1976 and said that uh, this the CIA should be disbanded and its responsibilities scattered around government. Uh, there's kind of an interesting story from uh, the time of the CIA's creation in 1947 with the passage of the National Security Act. J. Edgar Hoover went to President Truman to argue against this new law that would create the CIA. And Truman assured him that the CIA would not be a standalone agency. Well, with that, Hoover just assumed that the CIA would become a department within the FBI and that he would end up leading it. It did not. And um, Hoover had historically poor relations with General Bill Donovan, Wild Bill Donovan, and immediately the competition between the CIA and the FBI began. It got worse through the uh, 1950s, particularly with the overthrow of Mossadegh in Iran, with CIA interventions in Latin America. It continued to worsen through the 60s in Vietnam, through the 70s. I mean, you look anywhere around the world and you can see these failed CIA interventions. You know, this, this failed CIA intervention in Iran in, 19, in the 1950s that overthrew a, a, a democratically elected prime minister has led to a foreign policy crisis that here we are more than a half a century later, we still haven't gotten through it. Look at, look at Greece, which is, which is both a NATO member and a European Union member. And the Greek people still have not gotten past the trauma that was the seven-year military dictatorship installed by Henry Kissinger and the CIA. I have an attorney who was one of President Reagan's assistant attorneys general in the uh, early 1980s. And he maintains that the CIA has never succeeded in anything that it's done. It has missed everything from the worsening of the Vietnam War to the fall of the Soviet Union to the Al-Qaeda attacks of 2001. It's never gotten anything right. So when do we finally declare that the experiment has failed and it's time to move on? I think the time has come. I mean, that makes a strong case. And I mean, being former CIA, I don't want to go too far into what you did, but you did work in Greece at one point, if I'm... Correct. I I spent two years in Greece. And it it does seem like when the CIA intervenes, right, what's the, what are the wins? What are the actual, but what it does seem to be able to do, and maybe you can talk about this, is there seem to be very good at putting a good face on their failures or burying their failures. And it, that's one of the parts of that phrase legacy of ashes is they're so good at hiding it that apparently there was operations to go into North Korea. They would parachute people in, they'd get immediately captured and killed. It was a complete waste of time, but they were able to bury it. So is that the key to why they haven't been abolished yet is they are able to hide their failure so well? Well, I think that's a part of it. They are able to hide their failures very well. They're also masters at behind the scenes, public relations. 
Nicholas Hsu just came out with a book uh, in the past year about CIA activities in Hollywood and how the CIA has successfully recruited major A-list Hollywood directors, producers, and writers to essentially tell an inflated false CIA story of victory and progress and patriotism, when in fact, none of that is true. One of the great things about Legacy of Ashes, I thought, was the CIA's response to it. The author, Weiner, Tim Tim Weiner, I think his name was, uh, won the Pulitzer Prize for Legacy of Ashes. And after he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize, the CIA uh, came out with a statement saying that the book was unfair because the CIA's successes have to remain classified, right? So as not to expose sources and methods. I always used to laugh when they'd say that. And they, they've said it for years. Whereas the CIA's failures are frequently declassified, and that's the only information that's available to scholars. Well, that's nonsense. The truth of the the matter is that the CIA frequently fails at what it's supposed to do. You know, I've said many, many times in the press, in the public, that the CIA's job is very, very simple. It's twofold. One, it's to recruit spies to steal secrets. And two, it is to use the information from those spies to craft the best possible intelligence to inform policymaking. So that intelligence goes to the president, the vice president, the secretaries of state and defense, the head of the National Security Council. Those are the primary policymakers who are the consumers of CIA information. But if the information is bad, it leads to bad policy decisions. And we have seen that since the Truman administration. Right, and and Truman's original... As I understand it, his original idea was he just wanted like a newspaper that he could read. And that was really the end. He wasn't a lot of covert operations. It was just like, I want analysis. And in fact, that's what it was. It was an actual classified newspaper that was delivered to the president every morning. You're right. Right. (laughs) Well, and then we paired to a veered off course. And I guess that's where your own story comes in. Part of the reason I think you're so well known to the people who read Fire Dog Lake and now read Chatterproof is you were prosecuted for exposing or allegedly exposing, whatever, uh, <laughs> the, the torture program of the CIA ran that has been questioned. And you talk about Hollywood and Zero Dark Thirty. It, it seems like they're, they're very vigilant about protecting some secrets like sure. that. It seems are also, at least today, and this is where I want to kind of talk about John Brennan, there's also seem to be very okay with leaking things that hurt certain politicians they don't like? Or am I perhaps misreading these leaks in the press? Oh, the CIA leaks with impunity when those leaks have the support of the White House or when the leaks make the administration look good. It's always been that way. It, this, this is not unique to the Obama administration, although certainly there have been some incredible leaks through the course of the Obama administration that were never prosecuted. And, and before I, I really get to John Brennan, I'll, I'll tell you, Leon Panetta, when I wrote my first book, it took me nine months to write and it took me 22 months to get it cleared. I ended up having to take out 70 pages. And when all was said and done, the CIA asked the Justice Department to file a felony charge against me for the book. They, they didn't do that. I was never charged. And I didn't even realize that until I was arrested on other charges later. Leanna Panetta wrote a memoir and didn't like the pace of the clearance process. And he said, screw it. And he sent it to the publisher and it was published with all of its top secret classified information intact. Well, Leon Panetta was never charged with a crime. Leon Panetta wasn't even sued in civil court, which the CIA does quite frequently, where someone publishes a book that's not been cleared, the CIA successfully sues to recoup all of the profits and the book advance. They do that all the time. They didn't do that to Leon Panetta. So, you know, if you, if you've got four shiny stars on your shoulder, or if you're a friend of the president or you make the president look good, you can leak whatever you want and there's not going to be any, uh, any problem for you. And you can spy on the Senate. And you, you can hack can... <laughs> directly into the Senate's computers And then say that it was the Senate's fault that they made you do it. And you're still going to get off. I've known John Brennan for 27 years. I've never liked John Brennan. John Brennan didn't like me. 
I had no respect for John Brennan, but he does have an interesting backstory and he has very, very good political skills. Uh, John Brennan was, when, when I was hired in, in January of 1990 in the uh, CIA's Directorate of Intelligence, that's the analytics side, John was a uh, mid-level manager. He was in the, uh, well, I won't say where he, he was working on the Middle Eastern analysis. John did not get along with his uh, supervisor, who was really a legendary figure in CIA analysis. She was extensively published. She was well-known around town. They didn't like each other. And John went to her and asked for her support in his bid to enter into the CIA's Senior Intelligence Service. That's SIS. That's the executive levels of the CIA. She told him that not only would he never be in the senior intelligence service, but she didn't even want him working for her anymore, and he was fired. So when you are forced out of a job at the CIA, you have six weeks to find another job. And if you don't find a job in those six weeks, you are actually fired. So John immediately began pounding the pavement looking for a job. Well, this was around Christmas time. And jobs normally open up in the summer. There aren't many jobs open at Christmas time. So finally, he ended up going to the president's daily brief staff, the PDB staff, and said, look, I really need a job. And as it happened, there was one job open, and that was to be the PDB briefer for the lowest ranking person entitled to a PDB briefing. And that was the director of intelligence programs at the National Security Council who at the time happened to be George Tennant. So John and George immediately hit it off. They're both big, loud, ugly, star smoking <laughs> alpha dogs. And they hit it off. John would go to the White House, give the briefing. There used to be a cigar shop over on 17th in Pennsylvania. Both of their wives had had forbidden them from smoking. So they would go over there and smoke and then they'd split up. Well, then of course, George becomes the deputy director of the CIA. He promotes John uh, several times. John becomes deputy director of the office I was in. Then he becomes the senior CIA officer in country in Riyadh. Then he becomes George's chief of staff. And then finally, Deputy Executive Director of the CIA, which is the fourth ranking position in the CIA. Needless to say, John's old boss on the analytics side, he very quickly forced into retirement. Mm. So John was the number four in the CIA and then became head of what was then called the Transnational Terrorist Information Center. It was meant to be a standalone bureau. It, it later became the National Counterterrorism Center. And then the Bush presidency ended in 2008. Well, at the CIA in 2008, everybody took a side. Half the people went to John McCain. Half the people went to Hillary Clinton. But one went to Barack Obama. And that happened to be John Brennan. And that's how John Brennan became a star. You know, he was supposed to be named CIA director in 2009, but progressive groups jumped up and down and said, wait a minute, this guy was the number four ranking guy throughout the Bush administration's torture program. And he wants us to believe that he didn't know there was a torture program. Come on. <laughs> I was sitting in that room too. And I remember John Brennan being there. Right. There's no so, way he didn't know about that. No, program. no of course not. Now, he, okay. he was not a, he was not one of the creators. He wasn't one of the designers or the implementers, but he was in on it. So, John wasn't able to become CIA director in 2009. He had to wait for four years and then became CIA director. Now, a lot of people have been asking me why he would even respond to Donald Trump's attacks. And my answer, I think, is very simple. Because John is like any other political animal in Washington. He knows Donald Trump's not going to be president forever. But maybe John's going to be the secretary of defense in the next Democratic administration. Maybe he wants to be the Secretary of State. Maybe he wants to become the CEO of Halliburton. Who knows? But he's playing the, the hand that he's been dealt, which is a, quite a strong hand. 
Yeah, interesting. No, that's an interesting analysis and history there. Very fun history. Um, yeah, but it's what what's your take on because Brennan did, I mean, and in a very overt way for someone who's in the intelligence community, because if people were looking for, well, who's the intelligence community that doesn't like Donald Trump? And it looks like Brennan kind of offered himself to be the yeah. face of that yeah. opposition. He really is. Brennan is the face of the anti-Trump uh, faction within the intelligence community. You know, I never, when I was first hired into the CIA, one of the rules was you don't ever, ever talk politics under any circumstances because politics were irrelevant to intelligence. And it wasn't until almost four years, well, I'll, no, almost three years after my arrival, uh, it was the morning of the 1992 election. And my boss said in our morning meeting, he said, listen, I know we're not supposed to do this, but out of curiosity, who did you guys vote for this morning? And I'll never forget. It was three for Bush, three for Clinton, and two for Perot. And I remember thinking, wow, I'm not the only liberal here. I just assumed that I was. There was one incident I remember in 1996 where a woman was ordered to take down a Bob Dole bumper sticker that she had at her desk because we were to be apolitical. Right? I mean, you can love Bob Dole when you get home, but not here at the office. Apolitical. Well, that's that's all changed. The CIA has become very, very political. And I think that started really under George W. Bush. People took very clearly drawn sides, and it continued through the Obama administration. Was that because, is that like a post 9 yes. 11 polarization? Okay. Not, not know, a- when people say that everything changed on 9 11, they mean literally everything changed on 9-11, especially inside the CIA. And it's never, it's never gone back to, you know, the September 10th CIA. The agency's become very politicized. It's become a paramilitary organization when, in fact, it never was before. Again, the role of the CIA is to recruit spies to steal secrets and to do good analysis. It's not to send these, these private armies around the world to kill people that you don't like or to implement your own special forces policy or, or the drone strike policy, which was very, I mean, I almost feel like there was some kind of institutional pushback to actually get, because at one point, I mean, talk about paramilitary, the CIA was running the drone program and that, or was part of the process that was implementing the kill list. And that's not really intelligence gathering. That's, I mean, that's extrajudicial assassination in the case of some Americans getting killed. But I mean, isn't that a weird role for them to be taking historically? As a former CIA officer, I can neither confirm nor deny the existence of a drone program. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Well, fair enough. Uh, I, as a private citizen, will (laughs) say it. There's some kind of people getting killed. I don't know. Maybe it's (laughs) maybe it's all in my head. Okay. So. Moving on just to the situation where for people trying to understand what's happening with the CIA and Trump and this very public fight, I don't, I mean, what's your read on at least Clapper's position? Because he had a very interesting stance. He seemed to come out and talk about this dossier, this dossier by a former MI6 officer, now private consultant, Christopher right. Steele. Right. That made all these allegations, which, by the way, I just want to say, you know, I think BuzzFeed you know, put this out there and say this is unverified and some of it's factually incorrect. But here's the raw documents. Yeah. I don't really think that's journalism. No. But but um, <laughs> <laughs> but Clapper kind of on the one hand, it was kind of a kiss of death type situation. He went out there to say to try. It seemed to help Trump. But what he actually did was confirm that there had been a briefing which put Trump back in it. So can you talk about Clapper's position? And all of this? <laughs> Clapper tries very hard to walk this very fine political line, and he's just simply not good at it. And so you're right. Clapper tried to briefly remain above the fray. One of the things that Clapper generally does not do is to respond to attacks. But he's responded to attacks several times on this issue. One of those attacks having come from Donald Trump. And I think that's why John Brennan jumped in. John Brennan has, for whatever reason, a very deep-seated hatred of of Donald Trump. And I think it's because Trump has criticized him publicly. But for Brennan and 
Clapper to take sides on this, to speak publicly about this, to either confirm or deny rather than to say no comment that this dossier even exists, I think is unprecedented. I will say that I know that MI6 officer, Christopher Steele. I I actually worked with him in London uh, in the early part of the last decade. He is a first rate intelligence officer, absolutely first rate. He's a very serious person. I don't recall him being even remotely political. With that said, this whole story just strikes me as crazy. You know, Donald Trump is a lot of things, but he's not stupid. And I think that Trump's opponents and enemies have consistently underestimated him from the very beginning of the Republican primaries through the general election. And it's not just in politics. I'm talking also about, let's say, this call to the president of Taiwan. You know, everybody said, oh, my God, Trump doesn't understand the one China policy. He's going to screw up relations with China that have gone back to the Nixon administration. He knew exactly what he was doing. And we've underestimated him. Also, it's my experience that people here in Washington, including in the intelligence community, have found themselves in a reactive mode to Trump rather than a proactive one. They find themselves reacting to things that Trump says or does. And I think this may have been a ham-handed attempt to try to be proactive, and it backfired. The dossier itself or the Clapper? The the leak of the dossier and Clapper's comments about the dossier. Here's kind of my question. I mean, you're positioning it or offering an idea where it's just these people aren't actually thinking this through. They're just reacting to Trump. Oh, they're not. I think they're not thinking it through. I think John Brennan has has decided that the notion of Russian intervention is going to be his hammer that he's going to hit Trump with. All right. So, and and I wrote, I wrote about this in the article too, the reader supported news article. So Brennan has come out and said there was Russian intervention. We have this dossier on top of the Russian intervention. Take my word for it. Well, my God, everything that comes out of John Brennan's mouth is a lie. So why in the world would we take his word for it? I, I say in the article, The CIA told us they weren't torturing. That was a lie. The CIA told us there were no secret prisons. That was a lie. The CIA said that they weren't taking people to this dungeon in Afghanistan called Salt Pit. That was a lie. The CIA said that they weren't collecting uh, metadata on American citizens. That was a lie. John Brennan personally said we we didn't hack into the Senate's computers. That was a lie. And now he says, I'm not lying. I'm telling you the truth, so you should believe me this time. Come on. People are stupid, but they're not that stupid. <laughs> That's a good point. So, okay, that makes sense then. See, because I, I think from the outsider's perspective, what the public sees is there's two ways to read it. There's sort of incompetence or a, a sloppiness that would be reacting. And then there's other people who are reading it and getting very scared. Like, oh, my God, the intelligence community is completely against this incoming president. There's yeah. going to be an outbreak of a inner conflict war that could destabilize the federal government. I mean, are you not afraid of that or don't think that's a high no, possibility? I'm not afraid of that. I was on CNN last week and they asked me exactly the same question. And the response that I gave was this. What we're not talking about is a November 22nd, 1963 scenario. Okay, We're not talking about that. What we're talking about is the CIA knows that they can wait out this president. Because presidents come and go, and CIA people there are there forever. I mean, look at the people in leadership positions in the CIA. They've been there 25 years, 30 years, 35 years. They're going to they're gonna see this president through, and he's going to go, and somebody else is going to come more to their liking. So what they do is they slow roll the president. Maybe they don't try to recruit the toughest, hardest sources. Maybe they don't initiate that tough operation that they've been considering. They just slow everything down. And then four years from now, there may be another president and they can ramp back up again. I've also said in the past that if there's one thing that the CIA is good at, it is recruiting new presidents with a small R in recruiting. What I mean is you you get a president elected, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama immediately come to mind, who has no experience in intelligence, right? None. 
and maybe a little bit cynical about intelligence. And so the CIA begins briefing him in the transition period. And when he sees his first blue border report, right, something classified above top secret or black border report, eyes only for the president and the president-elect. And when they start briefing him about these incredibly well-placed clandestine sources that they have around the world, well, they bring him in. They make him a part of the club. He's one of the guys now. Uh, and they know that they've hooked him. But that's not happened with Trump. Right. They're that's trying to co-opt him, but it's not happening. Yeah. And they don't know how to respond to that. You know, when the news first broke about this fight between Trump and the agency, I'm talking about maybe six weeks ago, my wife, who was also a senior CIA officer, uh, had been traveling in the Middle East. And she called me from the Middle East and she said, are you watching this news about Trump and the agency? And I said, I am. And she said, this is bad. And I said, it is bad. And she said, no, I mean, it's bad for the agency. I said, it is. Because now they're not the big dogs at the table. Now there's a president in power who doesn't just smile and nod at everything that they say and thank them for their service and thank them for their excellent information. Now there's a president who's saying, I just don't believe you guys. <laughs> right. And, and also structurally, here's the other part of this. It's one, he doesn't have an interest in saying the Russian hacking story, which is why they shouldn't be playing it up if they're trying to co-opt him because he's... He's going to do everything he can to delegitimize that. Right. It also seems to be, and this goes to that paragraph I quoted earlier in the article, you know, Mike Flynn was the former head of the DIA. Yes. And he has, from what I've read in press accounts, you probably better, he has some antagonism towards oh, the CIA anyway. Boy, does he. Boy, does he? Cause listen, the, the DIA to, to every CIA officer, DIA is a dumping ground for people who weren't smart enough to make it into the CIA. <laughs> And that's the basis of the antagonism. It, it was generations before DIA analysts were even allowed to write for the president's daily brief. That was the, the sole domain of the CIA until just recently. But uh, that's really the nature of the antagonism because there's no respect between the two organizations. But is, doesn't that provide more fuel for the idea that Trump is actually, and probably part of the antagonism recently is going to, He's actually going to go after the CIA structurally, sure. which as as commander in chief, I mean, yes, he would need Congress to go along. And Congress probably has a better relationship with the CIA than he does at the moment, at least. But he could still do some serious damage. I mean, he oh, could sure he can. And, you know, he, he made a statement just recently saying that the CIA was bloated and inefficient. Well, you know what? It is bloated and inefficient. <laughs> and, and when a majority of your operational staff is actually sitting in cubicles in Langley, Virginia, rather than, than serving overseas, recruiting spies to steal those secrets we were talking about, you have a problem. And I think that's really what the CIA is worried about with the Trump presidency. You know, we had Clapper and Brennan versus Trump for a while there, but then Clapper backed off. Yeah, he dropped out. So who's really the boss? The DNI or the CIA director? Oh no, the DNI is not the boss. The DNI is simply a bureaucratic figurehead. And, and I say that for a couple of reasons. First of all, despite the title Director of National Intelligence, the DNI does not have the authority to appoint CIA station chiefs. That is the, the sole authority of the CIA director, right? So the DNI isn't even informed when somebody is being named station chief overseas. Secondly, the DNI's authority comes with his budget, but... Most of the larger budgets within the intelligence community are not controlled by the DNI. They're controlled by the Secretary of Defense. You know, NSA has a massive budget, but DNI doesn't have any authority over it. DOD has authority over NSA's budget. DOD has authority over DIA's budget. And Army intelligence, Navy intelligence, Air Force intelligence, those all fall under DOD, not DNI. I mean, the whole purpose of the DNI when it was created by George W. Bush was to put an adult in charge of George Tenet and his people because they had so screwed up the organization post 9-11. So really, it's just another layer of bureaucracy that affects only CIA, but not the rest of the intelligence community. 
So what happened when it seemed like Clapper and Brennan were together against Trump and then Clapper retreated? He said he had utter dismay, a profound dismay at the leaks that went out. And he said, we didn't produce that. Right. He said, we didn't produce that. And I don't think we leaked it either, I think. Right. That's what, and we stand ready to serve you, which was a completely different message. Did he break with Brennan at that point? Yeah, I think he did break with Brennan. Keep in mind also, and this is why I oppose military officers in these senior positions. Clapper's a general. And like all generals, he has spent his entire adult life saluting and saying, yes, sir. But you don't need somebody. You don't want somebody in those positions who's just going to say, yes, sir. You want somebody who's going to say, Mr. President, that's a terrible idea. And let me tell you why. Somebody who can stand up to a president. Clapper can't stand up to a president. But Brennan's a little bit more ornery. He's a little bit rougher and and tougher, frankly, than Clapper is. And I think that's why Clapper's dropped out, because it's not in his nature to challenge a president or even a president-elect in public. And for Brennan, Brennan doesn't care. Brennan's from Jersey. Yeah. (laughs) We know a lot of guys just like him. What about Mike Pompeo? Do is, is, you think he's up for challenging a president, the uh, former, the current uh, nominee for CIA director? Mike Hayden, who I loathe, said on CNN the other day that Mike Pompeo's only job is going to be to protect CIA officers from Donald Trump. And that if he can do that, he'll be a successful CIA director. I will say that Mike Pompeo's crazy right-wing domestic politics aside, I have some highly placed CIA friends who have briefed him many, many times, and they say that he is extraordinarily bright, that he understands the issues, that he is wrong on a couple of things, like Iran, for example, but he's somebody that they can work with. The key is, is he going to see the CIA rank and file as his constituents, or is he going to see the Trump White House as his constituents? And what agreements has he made be- to get the appointment? I mean, Trump had to have signed off, obviously, given he's his nominee. I imagine yeah. Trump told him, hey, these guys are not our friends, or I don't know what Trump's informed him of. Or maybe that happened before the outright public fight. But I imagine behind the scenes, Trump team was getting the impression the CIA was not happy that they were coming to town on January yeah. 20th. So I wonder I, what private guarantees Trump has forced Pompeo to get. I don't know. From firsthand experience, I don't know, but I can speculate. You know, there, there have been two events in the CIA's history that CIA officers called Friday Night Massacres. One was in October 1977, when then-CIA Director Admiral Stansfield Turner, this is during the Carter administration, just arbitrarily fired something like 140 officers from the Directorate of Operations, some of them just weeks away from retirement. He did it because the DO had failed. They had failed on Iran and uh, on, on a couple of other major issues at the time on terrorism. And it was time for a clean slate and he just fired them. That was probably a bad idea to just fire your most experienced officers, but that's what he did. And he did it on a Friday and they call it the Friday Night Massacre. The same thing happened in the very beginning of the Clinton administration. And it was because, and and we're seeing a parallel here now, it was because Clinton said that the CIA was bloated and inefficient, that there was a peace dividend because there was no more Soviet Union and we didn't need to spend all this money spying on every single country in the world. He also did it on a Friday. People were fired. It's the second Friday night massacre. Well, Donald Trump has come out publicly and said that the CIA is bloated and inefficient. He's certainly no friend of the CIA's leadership, as we've discussed. And I wouldn't be surprised if when he was interviewing Pompeo, he said that his vision for the CIA was more streamlined, more focused on overseas recruitments. And I want you to clean out headquarters and get rid of all these operational people who aren't doing operations. And plus, I mean, there has to be some kind of restructuring if one is to take Trump's foreign policy views at face, which is to say that he has a more realist school, if you like, of foreign policy where he does not believe in a lot of the liberal interventionism or neoconservatism, however you want to phrase it. He's not not on the Bob Kagan train of getting involved in these 
promoting democracy through the barrel of a gun. So isn't he going to have to do some culling no matter what? Because there's a lot of people who have been in the business of regime change and democracy promotion anyway. He, he will. He will. Every president puts his stamp on the CIA. Another thing about the CIA, too, as with any big bureaucracy, is that it's constantly changing, constantly morphing. Now, it changed a lot more than it normally has in the past under Brennan, because Brennan had a vision whereby he did away with the geographical divisions and created these these so-called fusion centers, right? So instead of having a Middle East division, a South Asia division, an Africa division, he has these bigger, broader counterterrorism center, counter-narcotic center, counterintelligence center, and you bring together operators and analysts and maybe some science and technology people and, and an admin staff and everybody works together and it's, you know, kumbaya. Well, that hasn't really worked. And it had been tried in the past. You know, Clinton tried it. There was even briefly a, an environmental center because environmental changes, climate change, AIDS, I mean, these were all major events that were going to eventually impact our national security. And George W. Bush thought that was a stupid idea and did away with those. Wow. Oh, he got rid of, I did not know that. He got rid of the deaths. So there's no like Middle East desk or North Africa desk. He tried right. to... That's what Brennan did. So who's resp- So then who takes responsibility when something goes wrong? Exactly. <laughs> Nobody, right? Nobody. <laughs> yeah, I guess that that does, that couldn't work out too well if you if I didn't realize he had made those changes. Maybe Trump. Well, maybe that Trump's coming back to a more nationalist, realist school. He'll, of course, that's sort of a question too. He might try to clear house because he wants a new mission set or a new paradigm, if you will. Yeah, that, that could be it. And you know, I hate when I, I hate when I have to defend Donald Trump. I just hate it. <laughs> but, but Trump's right about this. I mean, Brennan's reorganization was a bad idea. It was bad for policy. It was bad for the agency. It was just bad. And it didn't work. And I think Trump wants to go back to that original construct, which is a better idea. But I guess the question then is, the original construct, if he's going to take away authority... See, there, it does seem to be one period of time that people are hearkening to, and I understand you got a much more ex- expertise on this than the people speculating on the internet. But there was, you know, arguably when, because uh, Trump, people compare Trump to Nixon, and there was this sort of tensions, as we all know now, Mark felt was deep throat. Right. There was a under, and the people who did the Watergate burglary and the quote unquote rat uh, screwing across the country during the Democratic primaries were CIA linked. Yes. So there was this sort of hidden bubbling conflict. And so I just wonder if there's going to be, if, if Trump's takes away operational responsibility, not reorganizing and not right. paring down, but actually sort of says, I don't want the CIA to have, I mean, what, what else can they throw at him? I mean, this dossier seemed to be yeah. like the worst they could come up with. That, that would be the death knell for the CIA. If, if Trump took away operational authority and gave it to, it would most logically go to the Defense Department. That would be the death knell of the CIA. That's the whole raison d'etre of the CIA is to conduct operations. And if they no longer had that authority, then that would be the end of it. Aren't aren't they also in a bit of a power struggle with JSOC? And or is that something? Can no, also... no the, the agreement that they've worked out with JSOC is whenever the CIA wants to do uh, a, a sensitive operation involving JSOC, like the bin Laden killing, for example, they will borrow JSOC forces. So everybody involved in the operation is active duty <laughs> JSOC, but they're under CIA um, auspices. So it's technically a CIA operation, even though nobody actually on the ground is a CIA officer. Right. Right. And that's kind of interesting because this is the new field that I think you, you see the intelligence agency struggling to get in, which is cyber war. Yeah. And what, was revealed, and I know you're going to have problems talking about this, so I'll just say it. Um, what was revealed with some of the reporting on Olympic Games Stuxnet was it was a U.S. Cyber Command, which is at Fort Meade now, where the NSA is, but the CIA got their beaks wet, if you will, by getting in there and having sort of administrative authority over the NSA, meaning before the NSA would launch attack on the tons or whatever, there would be a CIA officer who would actually have to authorize it. 
So it was under you. It was inside U.S. Cyber Command with an NSA operative designing the weapons or the programs or the operations, and then a CIA person. They were tasked with basically having administrative control, which I guess created some kind of accountability because who? Because okay, well, yes, the NSA is designing all these programs, but they can't actually launch each one. You know, the tailored operations unless a CIA officer tells them they can. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I'm going to preface my comments by saying that the complete extent of my knowledge of Stuxnet is from the New York Times and the Washington Post. Okay. I know absolutely nothing behind the scenes on the Stuxnet virus. But I can tell you that it would make sense that that, that operation would be under CIA auspices because NSA is a, more of a passive collection agency. It's not an offensive operations agency. They don't put officers on the ground to infect computers, to recruit sources, to to do these things that have to be done by a human being. Oh, okay, because that's interesting. Because the way you read it when they talk about tailored operations is that NSA actually has operatives doing these things. So you're saying when they say tailored operations, they have people tailoring operations, creating these things. And the actual people who implement the weapons, whether that means putting a flash drive on somewhere or whatever, is a CIA operative. Correct. They don't have any human resources to do these operations. The CIA. Now, every once in a while on a TV show, like uh, Blacklist, for example, they'll talk about an NSA agent. And I chuckle to myself because <laughs> there is no such thing. Ah, interesting. Okay, so then CIA doesn't have to worry that much. See, I was wondering if... There was such an anti-CIA position in the Trump administration and Flynn's in there who knows how to – see, the problem with they got to worry about is maybe they have a lot of antagonism with Trump. Maybe he's pissed off at them, but he doesn't know where to put the knife in. Flynn knows where to put the knife. Right. Flynn does because Flynn's been screwed by the agency in the past, and Flynn has had a difficult personal relationship with Brennan. So there's there's zero love lost between Flynn and the CIA. This is going to be a rough relationship. Even when though it, Brennan will be gone? Even though Brennan will be gone. Because don't forget that Brennan, over the past four years, has been promoting all of his acolytes up through the ranks. And now they're the ones at the senior most levels of the, of the senior intelligence service who are going to take over the day-to-day operations of the CIA. So even though Brennan is gone, the CIA is still being run by Brennan's people. Yeah, that was one of my questions. What happens when the higher-ups leave? You know, Do they still have influence Somebody just recently said, once CIA, always CIA, or, you know, what role do these directors play after they retire? Oh, literally none. They even lose their security clearances. Retired directors are allowed to maintain a secret security clearance. I, I can tell you, when I was an analyst, every once in a while, a retired director would come to the agency, kind of for funny reasons. And I was instructed to brief them or have lunch with them in the director's dining room. And I was warned repeatedly, don't go over the secret level. I'll give you an example. Admiral Turner, who I spoke about a little while ago, Stansfield Turner, he and his wife were invited onto an around-the-world cruise for free. And in exchange, he had to give four lectures on Middle Eastern politics. So I was instructed to brief him on, and this is in the early 90s, on pro-democracy movements in the Middle East. Right. So we met three times for lunch in the director's dining room. He took copious notes, but I had to keep my briefing to the secret level. And then I would say that's classified. That's not classified. This I got from the papers. This I got from wherever. And he made sure to write down only the unclassified information. And that's what he used to give his speech on the cruise ships. But if there was anything top secret or anything involving human intelligence, we're not even allowed to brief it to the retired directors. And that's why people like George Tenet, for example, have nothing whatsoever to do with the CIA anymore. George Tenet works for a a venture capital uh, firm in New York City doing vulture transactions. He has nothing to do with intelligence. Oh, not even in QTEL. No, not even in QTEL, which was his baby. Right. That's what I was. Yeah. So Brennan will have no influence technically, but his team is essentially still him left behind. Yes. Because they have all the same sentiments, loyalties, yes. goals, everything like that. 
Okay. So if there so if there is a purge by Pompeo, it'll be of the Brennanites. It would be, yes. It would oh, and, be. And then so he can create his own legacy. If Tenet, if Brennan is Tenet's legacy, Pompeo will be bringing a whole new crew of people to be his and, legacy. And, and there's a precedent for this, too. In, in 1981, January of 81, Ronald Reagan wanted to clean the CIA out and get rid of all the Carter people. So normally a president comes in and he names a CIA director and a deputy director. But what Casey did, when, when Reagan named Casey CIA director, Casey named his own deputy director, but then Casey also named his own deputy director for operations, DDO, who happened to be a businessman with no intelligence experience at all. Now, that oftentimes doesn't work because the businessman has no idea what he's getting into. But sometimes you really do need a purge. And uh, I, I could see Trump coming to the decision that he needs a purge. Don't forget, all these people, and it's not just those at the very top, but down at the bottom level of the senior intelligence service, the, the people leading at group chief or higher, people younger than I am, they all came of age under Barack Obama. And so even if they're not in any way political, they still came of age under Obama and Brennan and Petraeus. And, you know, I, if, if Trump wants to start fresh, he can make it ugly and start fresh. I could see him doing that. I think he's signaling it, but I don't know. I think much. he's signaling it too. He hasn't come right out and said it, but I think that I, I think we would be foolish to not think that there had been conversations between Trump and Flynn and Pompeo about how do we clear this place out and start over again. And, and these latest spats over this dossier and the Russian hacking, the role of Russian hacking. I mean, if you were if you were trying not to get purged out, this would be the last thing you should be trying to do. So this would be the last thing you'd want to do, or maybe be a little conspiratorial. Maybe it was they started a fight with the CIA so they could rationalize the purge. I don't know, but hey, what a what a great Russian covert <laughs> operation that would be! Like, how do we get how do we get the CIA purred? <laughs> and then look, they've they've done it. I mean, I, I'm not saying it, it's the Russians, but, right. but how interesting. I mean, this is something you could, you know, write books about. Or how to just, I mean, just discredit the CIA. I mean, who, exactly. who, who, who's done more? I mean, if it was a Russian op, they, and all they wanted to do was just discredit the CIA. They would have succeeded immensely because now you've got people, it's all mixed up. Because I see people, in, you know, on social media and elsewhere defending the CIA who are left. Yes. Scared. And then you have people yeah. on the right who hate the CIA now, and they were their traditional supporters. It's just crazy. It's, it's, it it's bizarre. Bizarro world, reverse world. Yeah, I have two more things. They seem sure. to me to be acting more like, I mean, doesn't have to be CIA, it could be any organization, you know, like a, a threatened creature, sort of, and it escalates. When one action doesn't work, then, you know, the next week, the next Friday night, there'll be something else. They would try something else. To me, they act like Brennan or whoever else is involved seem to be acting like people who are threatened, but that's just a, an uninformed <laughs> opinion. But I do have one more question that happened over the last couple of days. President Obama's presser, there are a couple of people reading, more than a couple of people, reading something into this, something that he said. The quote is, he said, so with respect to WikiLeaks, I don't see a contradiction. First of all, I haven't commented on WikiLeaks generally. The conclusions of the intelligence community with respect to the Russian hacking were not conclusive as to whether WikiLeaks was witting or not in being the conduit through which we heard about the DNC emails that were leaked. And that's a long quote, but I see people reading something into the WikiLeaks witting or not as the conduit and that last thing, emails that were leaked. I see some people saying, oh, he just admitted they were leaked, not hacked. Right. I didn't read it that way. I thought it was a bad use of the word leaked. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 careless. I, I think he didn't mean to to definitively say that they were leaked. He meant like published. Right. Yeah. Well, that's an okay. interesting uh, point there, Joe. Like what, what is the CIA's view of WikiLeaks? I imagine it's very, I mean, I'm sure they hate WikiLeaks, but. It, it has to be one of, yeah, of, of deep 
hatred. Now, no CIA documents have ever been leaked to WikiLeaks, right? You right. go through you go through the Chelsea Manning cash, and it's all really low level State Department diplomatic cables, some low level military stuff. A lot of it, frankly, was unclassified. It was press, um, but there's not a single CIA document in there. So I think the CIA hates WikiLeaks for what it is, but there's no personal grudge against Julian Assange, I think, because he's never damaged or harmed the CIA in any way. Hey, can I add one more thing, too? Please. Vis-a-vis uh, Joanne's uh, uh, comment about the leak. Um, you know, Craig Murray, the former British ambassador to Uzbekistan, who's a member of Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, has told the British press that he was the conduit to WikiLeaks, right? He says that there was no Russian hack, that it was a whistleblower inside the DNC, he won't say who it was, who took the documents and gave them to Craig, and Craig gave them to WikiLeaks. Now, why the mainstream media has utterly ignored this, I have no idea, because Craig Murray is one of the most highly respected whistleblowers in the UK. The man's an ambassador, a decorated ambassador. And he's telling us that there was no hack. Well, and that maybe that you could talk about this for a second, just because I don't want to keep you too long. But what is up? And this goes to what you just raised, which is the press is so invested in this new yeah. Cold War. Yeah. This tension with Russia. And I can't figure out if it's sort of a reverberation of the Clinton campaign shoving all this talking point into their brains during the campaign and they can't let go. If it's you know, people who are still pissed off, if it's just a group of people who want to discredit Trump. But there is this, I agree, like I saw that report, I thought it was very interesting, other than Sean Hannity, yeah. which is the craziest, I, my mind's made of <laughs> We're in the bizarro world. Like bizarro that. world. Yeah. Other than, they, it's been completely ignored, and instead they have con- continually ratcheted up the tensions with Russia. It seems like they have a, like this is an agenda to get to get the U.S. and Russia to be in a conflict beyond yeah. the campaign. What do you make of that? I I'm, I'm getting exactly the same thing. It's like it's like for whatever reason, the left is not going to be happy unless there's this new conflict with Russia. But but nobody has accused the Russians of actually throwing the election. Nobody has accused the Russians of hacking into polling machines, voting machines, and switching votes, or hacking into the FEC or to state. Uh, electoral commissions. So what exactly is it that the Russians are supposed to have done? I'm not really clear on that. And besides, if there was a real hack, and Bill Binney says this all the time, and he's exactly right, because he's one of the country's foremost authorities on this issue. If there was a hack, regardless of how good the Russians were, there would be an electronic trail that goes right back to the Russians. And there is no electronic trail. If there was, NSA and CIA would tell us so, and they haven't. What they're telling us is, take our word for it. Right. (laughs) Also about uh, Obama's quote there, one of the things that really bothered me about it was, when he says, you know, the conclusions of the intelligence community with respect to the Russian hacking were not conclusive as to whether WikiLeaks was witting or not in being the conduit. And then also, there's a McClatchy article yesterday about, oh, well, they've been investigating this since the spring, and we think that uh, the Russian pension system was used to funnel money to hackers. Into, I mean, basically, if you believe that Craig Merry says, I basically facilitated this exchange, you know, it's sort of implying that he's a Russian operative of some yeah, kind. Yeah, right. He's a Russian which, agent or a Russian... Which is ridiculous because ridiculous. why would he offer his... Say, oh, yeah, I was involved. Yep. It's just... You're absolutely- I don't know. I think they're just still digging for something that people might believe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got, we're good. That's where that ends. So. Any closing thoughts, John, before we go? or? No, you know, like, like I always say with Shadowproof, thank you for what you guys do and what you have done in the past. Uh, Shadowproof and, and before Shadowproof, Fire Dog Lake was where I published my letters from Loretto, uh, my blog from prison. I owe you guys a debt of gratitude, and I'm always happy to speak with you. Thank you so much. We feel the same way, and uh, thank you for giving us time today. Thanks Great a to lot. talk to you, John. Thanks my so pleasure. much. John. 
Thank Have you. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, that's our show. I want to thank you for listening, and a special thank you to John Kiriakou, our guest. Read his work at readersupportednews.com. I also want to ask you to please support the show at Patreon, patreon.com slash aroundtheempire. $5 a month lets us put on the show. Questions, comments, or just want to yell at me, dan at shatterproof.com. And please see Joanne and my work at shatterproof.com. See you next time. Thank you.